Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension and Cooperative Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Laura Elbert. She's a professor in the Industrial and Systems Engineering Col uh, Department here in the College of Engineering. She was born in Park Ridge, Illinois, and she went to Conant High School in Hoffman Estates, Illinois. And then she went to the University of Illinois to get an engineering degree, and she got her master's and PhD in industrial engineering at the University of Illinois. <laughs> And then she went to Virginia Commonwealth University as a professor in Richmond, Virginia. But in 2013, she saw the light and came here to UW-Madison. She has a really interesting range of topics tonight. She's going to talk about advanced analytics for emergency response, bracketology, and beyond. I just wish we had better news about our basketball team being in the brackets this year, but maybe next year. Please join me in welcoming Laura Elbert to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Well, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. So, as Tom mentioned, I'm a professor of an industrial and systems engineer in uh, systems engineering, and I think today well, you'll learn a little bit more about what systems are and what systems engineers do. As Tom mentioned, I'm a professor by day. I'm also an assistant dean in the College of Engineering, and I wear several other hats in addition to these two. I also write a, bl a blog. My blog is Punk Rock Operations Research, and I'm also a vice president at the Institute for uh, the Operations Research and the Management Sciences, INFORMS. I'm the uh, VP of Marketing, Communication, and Outreach. So I'm very active in my community, and uh, it keeps me busy. There's a lot of fun things going on. Uh, today I was asked to talk about bracketology and also some applications of optimization and systems engineering. And so what I'm going to, going to do in my talk is first start with a roadmap. What's a system? What do, things, uh, what do systems engineers do? What kind of things do we study? And then the middle part of my, the talk will be about my research. Most of my real research is in uh, public sector operations research, so public sector problems. Uh, I'll talk about emergency response today, and I'll also talk about bracketology. And at the end, I'll offer some concluding remarks about analytics and operations research. All right, so I mentioned a couple of things, industrial engineering, systems, and operations research, and, and, and analytics. Uh, I'll start with a system. Right, so I study systems, and a system is a set of things. It can be people, vehicles, basketball teams, and even cells. And they're connected in such a way that they produce their own behavior over time. Uh, so I like to say that one car is just a single vehicle, but a collection of cars can be a traffic jam. And that's the type of behavior that we often study. Uh, my discipline is called operations research, and it's the science of making decisions using advanced analytical methods. So we're focusing on designing systems, focusing on these interconnections between components, and really engineering uh, a system that works better. Uh, admiral Grace Hopper, who's a, a, a Navy admiral as well as a computing pioneer, said life was simple before World War II. After that, we had systems. And this is a nod to how complex it is to design and manage systems, and it's also a nod to World War II. Uh, what happened in World War II was really the birth of my discipline of operations research. The name actually refers to military operations. Uh, that's why it doesn't refer to systems or optimization, even though that's a lot of what we do. Uh, in World War II, it was a major military campaign. We had to move troops around. We had to move around a lot of supplies to support the troops. Uh, that's a lot of what happens in a military campaign. And that's a huge problem. It's on a network. It's on a transportation network. There's a lot of moving pieces that are interconnected. And it's very expensive. And so small improvements that could be made systematically that would reduce costs or improve performance, those things really added up just because of the, the immense costs involved. 
Uh, and so that's kind of the birthplace of my discipline and also a, a reason why we need systems engineering. So we didn't stop with all those systems in World War II. We see systems around us all the time and they also need us to manage them. In my discipline of operations research, we've studied a lot of different types of disciplines. Transportation is the first one I mentioned, in addition to the military. So moving uh, goods around, freight travel, train travel, the airlines, scheduling all those flights, getting the crew on the flight, dealing with delays. These are all things that we can do. Manufacturing is another one of our classic application areas. So we don't make the stuff, we just make the system run very efficiently. Currently, healthcare is probably the number one employer of my students. Uh, there's a lot going on in healthcare. This is a, it's a big system. You have surgeries, you have uh, doctor visits. There's a lot of data and information that goes into those decisions. And there's a lot of delays. So treating a patient takes time, usually repeated visits. And coordinating those is uh, an opportunity to really improve health. We've also studied service systems, so optimizing networks of people working together. And this is a picture of a call center, but routing the calls to the right people and matching people with resources and using them in an efficient and effective manner. I mentioned public sector problems before. I've studied security systems, and in particular, aviation security quite a bit. We need a lot of efficiency to get through security checkpoints and emerging application areas. So a hot area right now is the shared economy. So when we go to a bike dock, we want a bike to be there, uh, no matter where we return it. We want, always want one to be available. And there's a lot of interesting challenges from a mathematical and applied perspective in the shared economy. All right, so our world is increasingly complex and it's very connected. And systems are really important for not only navigating the world we live in, but designing a better future. So as an engineer, a systems engineer, I really want to design a more efficient system, and I really want to maximize performance. And a lot of this, a lot of what we do focuses on improving performance. And we have a couple of main criteria. One is just making a system more effective. How well does the system work? So typically we're looking at throughput, getting things through the system in the quickest way possible or pushing the most uh, su uh, supply through. We can also maximize revenue or in the public sector problems, sometimes this is minimizing risk. We also look at cost, so how much does the system cost to operate, to design, to design a system. We can look at actual dollar costs, or we could look at costs in terms of human capital, such as waiting times. In general, we don't always get to entirely control the cost, so we look at efficiency. You'll hear me mention this in the talk, I think I've already mentioned it. And we want to design a system that's cost effective. So how do we get the most performance out of a given set of inputs? How do we get the most bang for our buck? Uh, this is something I think about all the time. So you might be wondering, what's stopping us from getting the most performance possible, the best possible performance? Well, the reason is we have limited resources all around us. And when I look at systems in operation, I'm constantly noticing the limited resources we have and where bottlenecks occur. And we can see evidence of the limited resources in terms of, for example, queues or congestion where lines form. There's usually a limitation there. Limited capacities or supplies. So we only, may only be able to make so many widgets per hour. And that might be a limitation in the system. And another uh, limited resource is time. So we quite often have time delays due to travel. I mentioned transportation problems. Uh, processing or information. So if you've been in the healthcare system, you, you're, you know you're waiting for lab results before you can make your next decision. And these all inform the design and operation of systems. When we think about getting the most we can out of a system, I, we want to think about a dial. This is how we think about it. How do I kind of maximize performance and increase the dial? But usually in systems it's a little bit more complicated. What we're actually doing under the hood is using our limited resources wisely. And usually this comes back to that system and these interconnections between the components of the system. If we can use our limited resources to manage those, we can improve the overall performance of the system. But that means managing a lot of these moving parts. I'll talk about applications in a little bit, but first I want to talk about um, data analytics and where they fit in. 
So we have a lot of world, uh, data available to us, and engineering is, is of course, becoming increasingly data-driven. And I have a picture here of a big data. It's the Niagara Falls of data, because there's so much data that's out there. And I would like to say the, da the data are just data. Right? The point of having all that data is that we want to turn it into information for it to be useful. Right? So there's a num number of mathematical and statistical tools that can help us get from data to information. As an engineer, I want to go one step further and use that data and information, apply some advanced analytics to it, and actually make better decisions and inform the design of a system. Uh, so I have this on a continuum, moving from data to information or insight and to decision. And we start with uh, the data part. There's actually a suite of uh, advanced analytical methods that help us answer all different types of questions. And so usually when we have a lot of data, we might ask questions like, what happened and why? Right? So this is very much looking backward at the data that was collected in the past and trying to piece together what happened. A number of statistical methods, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data, mi data mining, data visualization, the typical data science tools that you may have heard about are used to answer this first question. It's kind of looking in, into the past a bit. If we want to look into the more immediate future, we can say, ask what will happen, right? So we can talk about forecasting, uh, use forecasting and simulation methods here. We haven't quite got to a decision, uh, to a system yet, but if we ask the next question, well, what should we do? And this is where a decision comes into, into play. We can use optimization and more advanced simulation tools. And so in operations research, we call this prescriptive analytics because we're prescribing decisions. We're trying to understand what a good decision will look like. And generally, that's a good decision made in a system. So I've got my picture of my slinky here. And the slinky is to represent a system because if you move one part of the slinky, you're going to affect the rest of the slinky. And you see this in systems. If you change one part of the system, there's ripple effects that affect many other parts of the system. And that can be difficult to manage. Uh, this is why we have optimization. All right, so this is my pitch for what we do as, as systems engineers and why optimization could be useful. And the next part of my talk, I actually want to talk about some of my work in emergency medical services. And so this is actually ambulances and fire engines often responding to 911 calls. I've been researching in this area for more than a decade. It's really fun. Some of my research has been put into practice and can make a difference. And uh, that's a good feeling at the end of the day. Uh, the, questions, the research questions I will talk about today are how do we send ambulances to patients in real time? What's the best mix of vehicles for responding to calls for service? And what's the impact of severe weather and congestion on response policies? I won't really lift up, up the hood to show you all the details, but I'll try to explain some of the insights we get and some of the value of using optimization, as well as some of the trade-offs that we have to evaluate when designing systems. All right, so I first want to talk about what happens when there's a call for service. Uh, so ambulance, when an ambulance responds to a call, first the call must be placed. We've got over here. And when that occurs, there's some triage that's done on the phone. So a call taker gets some, collects some data. They try to figure out what's going on, and then they send the resource. Okay, so this is when they make their decisions way up front. And then they send an ambulance to the call based on this triage information. So it may not be perfect. There's a little uncertainty at this point. Uh, then the ambulance arrive, is sent to the call and it arrives at the scene. Just this next one here. And this is actually the goal of the system. So I talked about maximizing performance. In many applications, it's not really clear what performance is, especially in public sector problems. They're so messy with so many stakeholders involved. Emergency medical <coughs> services are the exception to the rule. The goal really is to have really quick response time. So typically the goal is nine minutes, and they want to get to as many calls in less than nine minutes as possible. <coughs> and this is true for every emergency medical service department in the country. They might just not, the only difference is that it might not be nine minutes, it might be a different threshold, uh, but they all have a, uh, the same flavor of goal. Um, after the ambulance arrives at the scene, care is provided, and typically the patient goes to the hospital, but not always, and sometimes that taking the patient to the hospital and transferring them to the hospital is most of the work that needs to be done in terms of the time that it takes. 
All right, so what's the challenge here? It seems pretty straightforward in this nice graph that I've showed you. Uh, well, what's going on here is that when the ambulance is sent, we make this decision up front with maybe slightly imperfect information, the ambulance is tied up for a while, right? So sometimes it can be 40 minutes, sometimes it could be two hours, it's a long time. And they can't respond to somebody else if they're taking a patient to the hospital. Right? So when they're servicing patients, they're actually called out of service because they're out of service for new calls. And this is, we have a couple of limited resources here. Our first limited resource is our service providers. We have only so many ambulances and paramedics and EMTs that can respond to calls. The second issue is uh, time. Right? So when an ambulance is unavailable for other patients when it's serving patients, we have to make a decision when a new call arrives between this patient at hand that's just called into the system and future patients that could arrive. Because our decision now might have ripple effects into the future. We always have to make uh, these trade-offs. So it's pretty straightforward if you have a, ver a, a very uh, a serious emergency that arrives to the system. You do everything you can. But what if it's a patient that's lower priority and could potentially wait? I don't want to delay service to patients. Um, but we have a lot of data, and I have a good sense of what could happen in the future that can inform some of these decisions. All right, so I've got my dial again. So our goal here is, is pretty straightforward with our dial. We want to increase the number of calls we can reach in nine minutes. And typically, we want to get to the most uh, serious calls within nine minutes. So some agencies or some departments really do triage the calls. and They'll have priority one calls, or they might use a different scheme to triage and categorize patients. And the point is to actually provide good health care and save lives. Uh, what goes on under the hood, of course, is optimization, <coughs> optimization to the rescue. So we want to design response districts and possibly locate our vehicles and staff them and schedule the service providers in a way that we can reduce the response times for most patients in the system. All right, so what this actually means is that, as I pointed out, some of the decisions are pretty obvious. The optimization tells us what we think we should do. If, if there's a very serious call, we send the closest ambulance, lights and sirens. We try to get there as fast as we can. And other times, it's less obvious. And I'll show you some of the results on the map. And this is all about managing these trade-offs between patients. So this is a picture of four response districts, around four ambulances in a county. And actually, most of the calls are sort of in that green region in the bottom right. And if you have a high priority call, you always just send the ambulance in the district. Right? What's less obvious is if that ambulance in your district is not available because it's serving somebody else. And this is where optimization actually has some value. It, it helps inform us about what a good decision could be for our backup service. Right? Our first choice isn't, uh, isn't available. Or maybe low priority patients. Right? It might be reasonable to have a slightly sh longer response time to a low priority patient if we can save a life. And that's what we find. Um, so we find that with so many calls in this green district, we really need to ration that ambulance for the high priority calls. What will happen if we don't is that there's so many calls there, it'll always be responding to calls. And the call all those patients, the busiest part of the region, will never have a, a very nearby ambulance. Uh, and that's not good. Uh, we find that there are so few calls in the red district that that can be rationed for low priority calls a little bit more than, than average. And if we actually look at our second choice for our high priority calls, we've got four colors here, and our second choice only uses the two ambulances, the blue one and the yellow one. Right? So this is not so obvious until we run the optimization. Uh, but now we have a plan because you know half the time our first choice ambulance isn't available, and now we're making uh, uh, much better decisions more frequently. Um, some of my other work has built upon this and has looked at getting the right mix of vehicles uh, to patients. And this was an exciting project because it was put into place. And I started working with this county in Virginia, and they had a lot of uh, semi-rural county uh, there was a housing crisis at the time. They didn't have, you know, they get paid through property taxes, and there were, they didn't look like they were going to increase their budget for a while, and the response times were pretty, pretty, uh, pretty long. So we looked at some strategies for improving the response to patients without increasing costs, and they came up with this idea, which I thought was brilliant. So normally you have two uh, staff members on an ambulance. So they can be an EMT, which is an emergency medical technician who does very basic care, or a paramedic, which is an EMTP, who can do much more advanced care. 
So I've just told you how to, you know, reduce response times, or at least that reducing response times is the goal. We're on a transportation network. It takes time. Well, if they had this great idea of replacing ambulances with these quick response vehicles, they could be SUVs. I've got a picture of one here. It was a small truck. It only requires one person to staff it. So now you can have twice as many vehicles. I can just spread them out a lot more. The odds that somebody would be close to the next patient that arrives is now much higher. Uh, but you've probably guessed by looking at this small truck that it can't take patients to the hospital. Right? So we've got some trade-offs here. In our, even though our criteria is really clear, we do have some trade-offs to make. Uh, so what we do is we have to send both an ambulance and a quick response vehicle. So now we're tying up three people instead of two. And we actually have to look at whether or not the paramedic did some, provided some medical treatment that only a paramedic can do. Um, and so we look at what actually happened at the scene, which becomes very important. That initial triage is not so important for figuring out how we use our resources. We actually have to look at what happened with our scene, at the scene. So when we look at this, we have to sort of weigh what could happen. And it was not so obvious initially, although I was pretty sure the quick response vehicles were a good idea. Uh, the quick response vehicles cannot take patients to the hospital. And even at the scene, before they go to the hospital, we have this doubling up. Okay, so that's, that's a bonus in that we can free up those quick response vehicles if they don't have to take the patient to the hospital. So even though we send three, maybe the paramedic itself gets freed up and can do something that only a paramedic can do, which can help the health of most of the citizens who, who need to dial 911. But sometimes a paramedic does need to go to the hospital. And in this county, it take, took about an hour uh, on average to go take the patient to the hospital. So now we're tying up three service providers instead of two. So we have this potential introduction of a huge inefficiency in the system. Uh, and this is why we need to use optimization and model the system and consider different scenarios. And we found that optimization uh, models suggested that this was a really good idea. Uh, so the county was great. They took, they used the idea. They put three quick response vehicles in, out in service. It's pretty nice. They wouldn't let me use my optimization to tell them where. They said that was too political for math. So I took their word for it. And uh, but it was it was nice to to see it happen. And what was great about this is the actual results were a lot better than I predicted because what happened was the service <coughs> providers actually responded to the system. And the paramedics would no longer give somebody an IV unless they really needed it, because they would much rather be freed up to serve another patient than have to go to the hospital. Uh, if it was, uh, so it was in their best interest um, to kind of be available for future patients. And I want to show a graph, because I'm so proud of this work. Um, as a professor, we don't always, and especially in public sector problems, we don't always get to see our work put into practice. Uh, but we found, um, by comparison to the previous year, that we improved the number of calls, or the fraction of calls responded to in less than nine minutes. Their goal was to get to 80%. The priority one calls in the middle there are the high priority calls that we are most interested in right here. And you can see we went from 75% the year before to 80% after. And in almost any application area, this is a really enormous increase or improvement in performance if you don't pump extra costs or extra resources into the system. Uh, so that was really great. And it improved the, resp the response to all calls as well. And it also won a national award, which is really neat. Uh, so this is pretty exciting work to, to do. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting challenges to work on. Uh, I really do enjoy working in emergency medical services. And there's a number of problems that I've worked on. And I'm also a native of the Midwest, as you learned earlier. So I'm sort of obsessed with weather all the time. <laughs> and I lived in Virginia. And it was really interesting to see how they could not respond to snow. And I think they're getting, <laughs> they have a snowstorm today. My neighbors saw me once shoveling the driveway. And they just said, you know, Laura, we know you're not from around these parts because you own a shovel. <laughs> but, <laughs> we got uh, 14 inches of snow in that nor'easter. and. I just needed to shovel my driveway <laughs> to not feel trapped, as you know how it goes. Um, but I've been very interested in responding to emergencies during emergencies, from regular weather events like snowstorms, but also more severe weather events. And I have a couple of research uh, projects. Some of are done, some are ongoing, where we're looking at this issue. 
Um, because what happens is everything is different. So I told you what we like to do and for typical day-to-day -day emergencies. We want to respond immediately. There's almost always an ambulance that we can use to respond immediately. And all that goes out the window when we have a weather event. right? So we don't want it to be a disaster. That would be bad. Um, but we, things can become disastrous if we don't manage them well. So after a number of these snowstorms, I started collecting data, and I started looking at the impact of congestion in the system. That's a nice way of putting it. So I looked at actually what's going to happen in terms of the system. So first of all, there's a surge of patients. And no, from what I've seen and from what I've studied, no matter what the emergency is, there is a surge of mostly low priority calls into the system. So you have these real serious emergencies that you need to respond to, but they get diluted by all of these other calls that happened. So before Hurricane Sandy, the mayor was telling people to dial 311 instead of 911 to help people self-triage and help them use their limited resources better. Uh, that's not the only thing that goes on. Critical infrastructure is impaired or destroyed. Now, typically, it's just impaired for a while if there's ice or snow, but that's actually pretty significant because all these ambulances are driving around on the road networks. And if you increase the amount of time it takes, Sometimes it's not the increase in call volume that is the problem, it's the extra time per call that really keeps these service providers busy, and now you're no longer allowed or able to respond immediately to a call. People have to wait. And this is a very engineering term, but I say we have cascading failures in the system. Uh, and that just means if there's a weather event and it's icy in one part of the city, it's probably going to be icy in many parts of the city. So we can't treat these as independent issues. Everything's sort of affected, maybe not equally, but a lot of things are affected in a similar way. And we started looking at what happened and what actually happens to the models. And I didn't show you what happened under the hood, but the, all of the math models we use make assumptions. And the assumptions have to be reasonable for the application that we're considering. And I make reasonable assumptions for everyday emergencies, but those assumptions can't really uh, be applied to other situations. And I have a picture there of an ambulance stuck in the snow for a reason, and uh, quite often, uh, public services are not managed very well during uh, weather events, unless they're really, really serious like a hurricane. Okay, So this really motivates a need for new models, new system engineering uh, models to help us design data-driven decisions for new situations. And so one of the things to think about here is that the decisions may be different. So most models typically would say you can always respond immediately and you should respond immediately. That may not be possible here if we have a big line that forms due to so many calls due to the surge and slower transportation. So we might have to strategically ask patients to wait for service. We don't want anybody uh, that really needs immediate care to wait for service. right? So we want to be really selective in how we ask patients to wait. But that might be something we have to do differently. So I have some papers that I've written in this area and some that are ongoing. And it basically studies uh, emergency response on congested networks. And we look at systematic ways to ask people to wait. And typically, we want to delay low priority calls when the system is very congested. And if we do this strategically, we don't have to ask too many patients to wait, or we don't have to divert too many to other regions. But we can really improve the performance of the system for the patients that need the most care immediately. I also had a student do a really nice work using simulation, and we studied a number of situations, Just and we wanted to study staffing levels. And what was really interesting is that we have human service providers. And I was showing you earlier some of the applications. You might have noticed that there's a lot of people in those pictures and those systems that we're managing, and that's true. And so sometimes people behave in somewhat surprising ways. And in the presence of congestion, people actually feel the pressure and the heat a little bit, and they'll work faster. And it's measurable. So we have enough data that we can actually measure that. And it's not a lot faster. It's just tiny bits. But we have a system of patients and service providers, <clears throat> and it actually does make a difference. We noticed that patients were slightly less likely to go to the hospital in a snowstorm. Uh, maybe they were uh, just the bad weather. They were a little bit more unwilling to travel unless they really had to. But those, it was just a small fraction of pa patients, a very small fraction. Um, but it made a difference, and it was almost like having an extra service provider in the system. And so the system itself was a little bit resilient up to a point of handling the congestion in, a, in the system. And that was really interesting. 
All right, so I want to switch gears. I know some of you might be here to hear about bracketology, and I have no explanation for the historic upset of Virginia. I was looking at the numbers before the day, and sometimes you know rare events happen. But there is a little bit more system to the rest of, of what I do and what I study in bracketology. I'll talk about basketball and football, although I got started in, in uh, football bracketology. Um, I got started, as mentioned earlier, I joined the, the university here in 2013. It was great. The, foot, the basketball team went to two Final Fours immediately. Uh, but the year after I arrived here was the first college football playoff. And somebody said to me, well, you should study bracketology for football. And, and I agreed. I thought that was a great problem. And, you know, it's painful to watch college football if you're an Illinois alum. So the math is a little bit more comforting to me. And it keeps me going. And I do post the Big Ten rankings. And it's, it's sad every week for me in some ways. But I like, the, I like the methods, right? So my goal here was really to forecast the first college football team. So there's no optimization here. But it's really kind of this data-driven, data science problem. And I actually wanted to do some forecasting. How do we recognize which teams might have a chance? And what's interesting about this problem is the college football season is really short. And I wanted to see if we could do this with math and small data, just a few data points. The teams play about 12 games. And I also wanted to bring this into the classroom a little bit and use some methods that I uh, have in class to talk about this. Not everybody follows football or basketball, but students understand winning and losing and trying to recognize the best team. And it's kind of interesting. Um, so what the method that we use is Markov chains. So this is a mathematical model. I will open up the hood a little bit on this one, and you, we'll talk about this. And this is a mathematical model that helps us understand how a system evolves over time. And you can wrap an optimization model around it. And I do that in other parts of my research, too. Markov chains are used very widely. They uh, model systems that operate probabilistically. So they often are used to model financial systems. They're used widely in epidemiology to model the spread of disease or even zombie outbreaks. And they are, provide the science of cues, the science of waiting in line. There's a science to it. And so there's a wide variety of applications to Markov chains. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. So those are probability models, but you can also introduce some data into the system. And you, know, you can ask questions like, how will a system perform over time in an uncertain environment? Right? So this is something that a Markov chain uh, can answer. I also wanted to ask questions with my bracketology about how do we draw conclusions from limited data, and how do we make data-driven decisions in the presence of uncertainty? All right, so I want to talk a little bit about how we, we do this with sports. And I'm going to show you a picture of this. And it's pretty intuitive, because in a Markov chain, you move from state to state. And so this is the college football season, uh, season in 2014. It's a graph. And we move from team to team. So each team is a state. And you can see here that the teams are connected if they play each other. And you can see these clusters of different colors. And these are the conferences. You can see that there's a lot of structure here already when we look at the system. Some of you are trying to find Wisconsin. So there you go. Uh, so you can see the Big Ten up there. And what we do in the Markov chain is we sort of vote. right? So I'll introduce a partial voting scheme in a few minutes. We vote for the team that beats you. Okay? If several teams beat you, like Illinois, you can just choose one of them randomly. And you move to that team. And Wisconsin last year would just vote for Ohio State. Okay, so what you do is that you'll notice if you're not a good team, you quickly leave that team to, and you're more likely to visit better teams. And if you're a good team, you're visited quite often. And if you're a great team that has a great record, you win a lot and you beat good teams, you're visited the most frequently. And so this amount of time we spend visiting the teams, and you, know, you can imagine something wandering through this system for an infinite, over an infinite time horizon, we will recognize who the best teams are. We have the single metric, or the fraction of time we spend in each team. And it actually works pretty well. Some of you may be wondering, does this have other applications? Or maybe I've thought about this. I've heard about this before. And Google's PageRank algorithm, one of the algorithms that changed the world in which we live, is based on the Markov chain. They don't have games, they don't have winners or losers, but they look at websites and they see who they link to. So most websites have links to other websites. 
And if you look at analytics, it would probably just send you to informs.org. Or if you are very interested in the best engineering schools, it would probably take you to uh, UW-Madison's homepage. Right? And this is because all the places that uh, are, talk about analytics link to informs. And places that talk about great places to study engineering, they might link to Wisconsin among some of our other great schools. And the, you have these websites here which are illustrated by smiley faces, but the ones with the most incoming links are the biggest. Right? So they will show up first in your search results. So I'm looking out at the audience, and you look like many of you are old enough to remember internet searches before Google, and they were pretty terrible. I've used most of these, and they, most of them don't exist anymore, because once we had Google, the, best, the most information, the sites with the best information typically showed up first. And we no longer needed a human to parse through. We could just do it using math. Just math could recognize where the important information was in the internet. And it works with ranking sports teams uh, as well. All right, so how does this all work for ranking sports teams? It's pretty simple. I use simple data, and part of this is so I can teach with it for students who think, many of my students are international, and they think football is a different sport. So, but we use simple information. I use a partial vote scheme, right? If you win by a lot, you should get more credit than if you win by an overtime or win by a point. And so we have to look at game outcomes. When, in this case, it's just score differentials. And I look at home or away status. So home field advantage is a huge thing, especially in college sports, and I adjust for that. So you get less credit for winning at home than you do on the road. And I'm often asked, well, how do you account for strength of schedule? Well, the Markov chain accounts for strength of schedule. It's just endogenous into the model. It captures these movements from team to team. At the end, I'll talk about how I actually use this for forecasting. And I simulate the rest of the college football season. I don't want a human in the loop having to figure out who the top teams are. I want to do it automatically. And I can do this if I can rank the teams. OK, so. Here's a quick example. This is from a couple seasons ago when Wisconsin made the tournament. Um, and they, beat, they played Rutgers twice. So in college basketball, many of the teams play each other twice if they're in the same conference. And I can use this as my data for evaluating this partial votes that I'm going to be giving to teams. So the first game, Wisconsin beat Rutgers by 20 points at home. Okay? So I have to figure out what this partial vote is. And you can see four arrows between these two teams. And this partial vote, you give the rest of your vote to yourself. So it's an arrow back on to, uh, from a team to itself. And I only need to know this one parameter, W, which is my partial vote parameter here. So the question is, how much credit should Wisconsin get for beating Rutgers by 20 at home? Right, so this is uh, the question. I want to have a data-driven answer for this. So I don't have the exact answer. But I can say, well, what's the probability that we'll, Wisconsin will beat Rutgers next time on the road? Okay, so I can start with that, and I can look at this, and I can plot all the data. So I took all the data from several seasons, and I said, put the home game, or the first game score differential on this x-axis here, oops, and the next game on the y-axis. So you can see where the no games end in a tie, so you can see this kind of cross where the zeros are. And this slice here for winning by 20 at home in the first game is kind of the Wisconsin-Rutgers situation. So one thing you'll notice here is you'll see sort of this pattern. It's positively correlated to a large degree, but it's not perfect. So if you actually look at the amount of data points above the line, which would be a win for Wisconsin in the next game versus below, you see that there's actually a good chance a team would lose in the next game, even though they won by 20 at home. Right? But this is what the data tells us. Uh, so we can actually fit a distribution to this, and I use logistic regression. So it's a real workhorse in data science. And it's uh, fitting a curve to a line, and it's always between 0 and 1. So it always gives us something that's a partial vote. You can see here that there's about a 62% chance that the team would win the next game on the road. And they will not benefit from home field advantage next time. The opponent will. Rutgers will in this case. Um, but this is kind of a surprising answer, but it gives us a data-driven answer. You'll also notice that, let's say you happen to tie the first time, you will actually have less than a 40% chance of winning next time. Right? So home field advantage is pretty huge. And I have to make the adjustment for home field advantage and account for what a neutral site win probability would be. And I'll show you how I do some of that. 
So I end up getting this line here. So this is my S-shaped curve. I use log point differentials. This is especially helpful in football when they run up the score. And mathematically, that makes a huge difference. So I have to do something about that. Uh, one of the issues with these curves, though, is let's say you win or lose by a point. So you're right here on the zero mark. You actually get about the same credit. You have about the same probability of winning the next game. And I don't want to give those two teams the same amount of credit for winning or losing by a point. You won. You should get some extra credit there. And so I use the pure vote model, which is you get everything if you win and nothing if you lose. And I sort of average them together to get this red line here. And so now there's more of a difference between losing by a point and winning by a point. And in football, this is, seems to be the special sauce that makes it work because there's only 12 games in the season. And that, this gives, the red line gives me my partial votes that I get. So the Wisconsin Rutgers example, Wisconsin did beat Rutgers by seven on the road next time. And they have a 62% chance of winning on a neutral court, but I would give them 68% uh, of the vote for the win. Okay, there's a, there's a lot of basketball games, there's thousands of them. Um, so I put it all together for all of the teams, and you know, then I look at what the math set says. My selection Sunday rankings this year look like something, uh, they look reasonable, right, for selection Sunday. I do have Virginia ranked number two. You see Nevada here is 24, and Loyola is just off the, the charts here. Right? It was, they were actually pretty highly ranked. Um, so we see some of the teams that actually make it into the Sweet Six themes, uh, Sweet Sixteen that seem like upsets actually are ranked uh, quite high. And, you know, some teams blow it in the tournament. The math can't tell you when that will happen necessarily. It's, it's, uh, you can make an educated guess, but you never really know. At the end of last season, Oh, there's Wisconsin, sorry. 68, they were, I have a composite ranking too that uses Markov chains and some other things and they were a little bit lower than 68. And that was, that was even sadder. Uh, and last year, these are my rankings. I had Wisconsin ranked number 12th after the tournament and North Carolina was correctly recognized as being the number one team in the nation after winning the national championship. All right, so college football is where I started and it works in a similar way Except the rankings just tell you who's highly ranked now. It doesn't tell you anything about the future. I like to, to know about the future. So I wanted to look at who the best teams are at the end of the regular season. And so I ended up using the rankings, but then simulating the next week of games. And seeing at the end of all this, the end of my simulated season, who would be ranked in the top four. Right? So the rankings are great. They give me the top four teams. Um, and as you know, the top 68 teams do not make it into the basketball tournament. There's a lot of automatic bids. In football, we don't necessarily have that issue. So most of this uh, looks pretty similar to what we saw before. I do actually have to observe a few weeks of, uh, of games, so usually about six games, which takes about seven to eight weeks of, of play to collect some initial data. I do my rankings with Markov chains, and then this middle part is new. I, so I simulate the next weeks of games, and I use another logistic regression model here to understand or, uh, what the outcome may be. And this looks at the difference between the rating and the two teams. Helps determine this win probability in this step. I simulate the rest of the season, including the conference championship games, which is really critical for understanding who might make it into the playoffs. And this past year was the only year I disagreed with a committee on one team. So in four seasons, I've done pretty well with the math. Uh, this is what I had last year. I did have Wisconsin ranked fourth after the loss to Ohio State. They lost one game to a really great team. I thought they were way up there. It's, um, and I don't give anything special to Wisconsin in my rankings. Um, there was a big cluster around right below that. And so Alabama was seventh, but it was almost a tie with some of the teams ahead of them. And they were ranked number one at the end of the college football playoffs. Um, this is what my rank, these are the rankings, right? So this doesn't have the forecast in them. One thing to notice here as you look across the top is you only see Wisconsin in this one spot here at number one. Uh, but you see them up near the top. You see Alabama a lot in the top two places. You'll see the impact of a loss right here. So Alabama went, goes down two places with a loss. This is just the ranking. 
What's interesting about the simulation is that it tells us not only about the strength of schedule, it tells us about the strength of our future schedule and how hard it is to get it into the playoffs. Um, and we see that uh, when we look at the simulation results. All right, so here's at the end of our rankings is what we have on selection day. Uh, our forecasts look a little bit different. First of all, you see Wisconsin at the top a little bit more, and this is because the Big Ten West really is easy. That's an easy path to the playoff, to be honest. Um, and I think Wisconsin this year could have made it in even with a loss. And you see some of the teams are actually ranked differently, and this is because some teams have a more difficult path to the playoff. And here you'll notice that when Alabama loses, they were uh, pretty unlikely to make it into the playoff, so they really needed Wisconsin to lose. And the drop-off was because they lost the opportunity to play in the SEC championship game, and that's an important part of the path to the playoff. That's not my opinion, that's what the math tells me. And that's something that pops out of doing the models and something that we can learn from all the models. Uh, so just to prove that my model works pretty well, this is what I had the year before, this past year, and um, I, worked, I agreed with the committee. I had Clemson and Washington tied for third, uh, third seed. Uh, but it's pretty amazing. I've, been I've just been amazed every year that just the math can rank the teams and do pretty well in the forecasting with just a few games. Uh, it's, pretty been, it's been pretty exciting and, and fun to do. All right, so I want to wrap a few things up at the end to bring things back to systems engineering and analytics and, and uh, some ways we can think about it. Uh, the first thing I will say is that as an engineer, I say that the data very much look into the past. They're very backward looking, and I tell this to my students all the time. Data reflects something that was collected in the past right, at some point. As an engineer, I'm really much more focused on the future, and I like to separate out those two ideas to, to stay focused on system, de de uh, system design, making better decisions, designing systems. These are all things that we want to do in the future. And we have to understand the limitations of the data as we're designing data-driven systems. I'll repeat again, the data are just data. We want to turn that inform data into information for it to be useful, and then we want to apply advanced analytics like optimization and Markov chains to that uh, information and data to make better decisions. I'm a big fan of a lot of the data science methodologies. We hear about data science so often, uh, but what you may not know is that data science doesn't tell us a lot about the system and how to manage a system. Uh, those methods are just better used to answer other questions. And prescriptive analytics and optimization really help us manage these connected systems where we have many interrelated decisions to be made. And also, we don't always need a lot of data to make a difference and to design a better system. I think about the future a lot. I have some pictures here of some fake robots. That my, some are my favorites, and an actual self-driving car. Uh, I think a lot about data-driven engineering and autonomous vehicles. And you know, some people ask me, well, are humans going to not be part of the loop? You know, I talked about not having humans in the loop or having humans in the loop in my talk today. And you know, there will be a lot of automation. But you know, quite often, we will see a human in the loop somewhere in many applications for the foreseeable future. Even automated vehicles need a human to step in and uh, take over or perform a procedure here and there. Um, and, and that tends to be the case in systems engineering. With systems with a lot of uh, interconnected parts, quite often we have human decision makers that have to, have to do something in the decisions and make a decision. So analytical models can also supplement human decisions instead of replacing them, and we're increasingly seeing this right now. Uh, the example from my talk is I study a lot about response districts, and we still have call takers. We still have people that have to make the decision. The software might make some recommendations, but a person at the end of the day needs to make that final call. <laughs> Same thing with doctors. They're, uh, they're increasingly using algorithms and looking at risk assessments, but the doctor all still makes those treatment decisions. Uh, finally, I'm an optimist. I study public sector problems. When advanced analytical methods started to be used for public sector problems in the 60s and 70s, uh, somebody wrote something, and they said planning and the emergency, uh, emerging policy sciences are among the more optimistic of professions. The representatives refuse to believe that planning for betterment is impossible. And I, d I think engineering is very optimistic, 
and it's part of why I like being a systems engineer. But who knows, I could be wrong, this is just my opinion. Uh, but I'd like to wrap things up. I am very grateful that you're here tonight with me on a Wednesday night. It was a pleasure, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Getting back to your citing of the rapid response vehicles, mm -hmm. and you said they wouldn't take your input into that because there were various political constraints. Is there mm -hmm. any methodologies for actually incorporating political constraints into your analytics? Oh, incorporating political constraints? You have an example? Whatever the constraints were that <laughs> oh, led right. them to do that citing. Oh, yeah, for that one it was okay. They wanted <laughs> basically the quick response vehicles to be a little bit spread out so you could possibly not let them be located anywhere in the county. You might want to specify one has to be here, one has to be in here, and one has to be over here. So there's, there's some possible ways to deal with some of those, uh, those issues. So there, there, there are opportunities. Mm -hmm. Over here. Have you helped the city of Madison at all? Um, I've noticed in the neighborhood that someone called for an ambulance. And not only the ambulance showed up, but like a fire truck. Mm -hmm. What gives the, is the fire truck the speedster uh, vehicle mm -hmm. that, that you described? Yes, that's a great question and a great insight. So in most communities, the fire and EMS are together in the same department. Historically, they've been that. And quite often, the fire truck, which has usually three or four personnel on them, is the quick response vehicle. And there's few fire calls, so they have the bandwidth to respond to those. They don't take patients to the hospital, so they are freed up after usually about 20 minutes at the scene in many communities. It's a good use of resources, and if they can get there faster than the ambulance, you know, they have the potential to save a life. I guess, yep. I had a question, I guess, in response to his there and your mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, I've seen the same thing yep. many times, but I see the emergency vehicle arrive considerably sooner than the fire truck. What is the advantage of having the fire truck then? I have never heard that out. Oh, Any response yeah. for it other than they're trying to make more money so you pay higher taxes. <laughs> they might be doing that, but, I, but there actually is a reason for that, and it's counterintuitive. Um, but sometimes they actually need more than two people at the scene initially just for a few minutes. Um, and I've done this, I've learned this from just doing ride-alongs, which is always why we have to do ride-alongs as engineers, make sure we're studying the right problems. But sometimes with some of the patients, they need two or three people to stabilize the patient and to get medical equipment ready. And then somebody might need to collect some information from somebody who lives there. So sometimes it takes three or four people even uh, for just a few minutes, and after about usually that first 15 minutes or so, they're okay. Um, but sometimes it really just, it really helps. Mm -hmm. In the back. I wonder if you'd uh, talk about climate change and the science of resilience and engineering response to climate change. Oh, that's a good question. I'm not, probably not the right expert on response to science change. I will say we have an increasing number of weather disasters, and I think um, as somebody who's worked in the disasters area, both for homeland security and now emergency response to weather disasters, there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of us studying the, those issues. And that seems to be a priority for basic science, which I, which I think is great and I support, uh, because I think it will be, be around for some time to come. So I'll leave my answer kind of short for that one. Um, so I think there are a lot of challenges there and also opportunity for us to manage our resources wisely. Yeah, so that's a good question. So specifically why I, I use the logistic regression. One is I based this method on something existing in the literature. And second, I actually wanted to get that nice curve to, uh, which I end up using for the rankings, but also it's used later on for the win probabilities. I also tested out a few things. So I have a composite method that does other, uses other methods. Not all of them are curve fitting. It just seems to work pretty well. Um, and I've also, um, 
which is kind of a short answer to that question. But it answers that question of the probability of winning in the next game pretty well, and this seems to be a good tool for that. I have tried um, not too many others. I've tried different inputs uh, for that as well. Um, I've done some of the validation on it, and it seems to work fairly well. I don't have all, it's been a couple of years since I've done some of the comparisons on that. But that's a good question. I know that there are a couple other methods out there that, that use that, uh, that might use other functions, and I haven't tried all of them. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Have you studied, or has anyone studied, how to decide where the breakover point is in emergency response from this is everyday service yeah. level dealing with, and, oh my god, we have a mass casualty or a mass weather event or something mm -hmm. that it's now time to flip to the other. Oh, right. That's, that's a great question. That's what I'm trying to do in my research. So I try to focus a little bit on um, the middle, you know, before you get to a huge disaster. Because uh, one of the interesting things that I've noticed in the literature is that we have the uh, there's a huge stream of literature for like everyday emergencies. Then there's another huge stream of literature like we have to evacuate the hospital and it's mass casualty events. And then we have all these other weather of emergencies that happen in the year that overwhelm the system and that are, you should switch over into that, and they don't study, they don't study it really well. And so what's interesting, if, um, what I found was really interesting is that there was a 2010 snowstorm in New York City. It ended up getting the sixth most highest number of 911 calls. Um, that was the one where the chief got fired because it, they mismanaged the resources so badly. And you know, it's, it can be sometimes very hard to identify, and, and I can see that that there's often a mismanagement of resources in these pretty severe weather events. But if they're not severe enough and people don't recognize it, we have pretty bad problems. That's a really good, uh, good observation. Mm -hmm. What is your comment when cities like Singapore and others use smart cities? And the use of ambulance and all is part of the smart city infrastructure. Uh, you think your method can be expanded as a as a part of the smart city concept and implementation? I don't know too much about the smart city concept, but for what I do know, I'm very excited about it. The models uh, and the resources and the protocols, though, are very country dependent. I've talked internationally about emergency medical services, and it's fascinating. Um, so you have to look at how they do things in different countries. I gave a talk in Germany, and they were just flabbergasted that doctors don't respond to every call. And you know, the, there are some real s significant differences in how countries do things. But I'm a fan of using our critical infrastructure in, in a connect, smart and connected way. I think that uh, is a good opportunity to make some pretty, uh, pretty large improvements in operation. Can you talk more about the German system, uh, how it compares to ours, if they have docs responding where we have... EMC oh, that's good. I wish I knew more about it. I only know a couple of superficial details about how the system operates. So I can't talk about that in, in a lot more detail. The reason I'm interested mm -hmm. is with the Boston Marathon bombing, one of the comments was, um, if you're going to blow a bomb up somewhere, Boston or the Marathon would be the place to do it because so many um, pretty highly trained medical people docs, nurses, et cetera, were on hand. That's true. And I'm wondering um, what else we could learn from other countries, whether it's France or Germany or Australia or Japan or whatever. <coughs> or does this country not learn from other people? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I didn't mean to put it up. That's good. Interesting food for thought. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for covering me. <laughs> Yeah, in the middle again. Um, when, we're, when we were looking at um, the plot of a point of control for the first game to the second game, mm -hmm. um, is there, did you think about, or have you, have you studied whether there is a correlation for, say, first game versus third game, or something like that, in order to try to make, say, another one option? Or, okay. Um, um, seeing whether that 
Oh yeah. Later, like, games that are further apart. Oh right, right. I haven't studied that. Um, that's an interesting question, but what, uh, so I'll answer it in a different way with the answer that I know. So I can do that in basketball because many teams play twice in a season. They don't in football, and so I've had to use subsequent years of data. And it's um, it's interesting that it's it was just as accurate, and the function was very similar. Um, when you have an entirely different football team, not entirely different, but it is a different team with many of the same players. Um, and that's just because of the limitation of the data on football. I haven't specifically looked at how close and how far the teams are apart. That is very interesting because of injuries, and you're much more likely to have different team dynamics as if they play each other very far apart. Um, and that might maybe help uh, the predictions a little bit. That's an interesting insight. Mm -hmm. What uh, is the amount of statistical deviation that you have on when you're figuring uh, your your exponents here and everything? Um, basically, I, I, mm -hmm. I'm observational. You know, yeah. it, that's easy enough to figure out because there isn't any, mm -hmm. or it's minimal if anything. But on anything future planning, that could be substantial with that. Okay. So what do you mean about this future planning? Um, and I'm kind of looking for the deviation off of like, okay, you're, you, you say you're specifically more concerned with future yes. uh, views than you are with observational or Newtonian classic you know, views like that. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the deviation off of the norm that oh, you consider? Right. And it's, not, mm -hmm. it's excluding disastrous repercussions. Yeah, forecasting is really hard. <laughs> that's what you're saying. Uh, that's definitely the case. And at least in the forecasting I do in football, there's only you know there's a lot of rules to the game and how you can get into the football playoff. So th that might be a little bit different than a general forecasting of the future. Uh, the general answer is yeah, things are are very difficult, and as you get more into the future, there's a lot more deviation. Um, typically, when I'm looking into the future, I'm kind of I'm designing a system, and I'm not usually doing forecasting there. So that's a, a different answer to a different question. But it's looking at the future, as you pointed out, and um, I don't always get to see what I do put into place, and it's usually not put into place exactly. So it's very difficult for sometimes to measure. Here's what the model said, and here's what happened in practice, and how do we marry the two? Because there's some fundamental differences. Um, Sometimes, you know, so, and it's also application specific. So we'd have to kind of sit down and look at a case study here or there if we're actually looking at a more of a designing the system question in terms of operation in the future versus forecasting. Have you done that where you've looked back at a system where you put it in place and, lo and looked at the percentage of deviation from mm -hmm. what, you, what your original prediction was? The closest was for the emergency medical service graph that I had. I had the before and after. It doesn't show, did, I don't have the comparison here to the actual predicted, but I showed maybe, I did not show a 5% improvement in performance. It was more moderate. I think about a 2 to 3% at most uh, there. And that was just because people started doing the job differently once they had a new system in place. And that was a little bit more difficult to predict. So a lot of times we get around that by looking at different scenarios and trying to at least bound the differences that could occur in, in, in practice versus what the model says and just to ensure that we're okay with, with those scenarios when they actually occur in practice. Question? Good. Thank you very much. Thank you.